I thought it'd be interesting to try and make some of my own homebrew oscillators. I'm aware of how things like voltage controlled oscillators work and phase locked loops, um, but I've never actually built one. So I thought it'd be interesting to, to sort of have a go at that and, you know, how hard can it be, right? Probably very hard. Um, I'm not expecting anything precise to come out of this. But yeah, it'll be fun. So I'll sketch a little bit how um, how oscillators work, or at least some of the kinds of circuits that I'm expecting to make, because it might be useful for reference. So to begin with, to make something oscillate, you need a circuit which has some form of drive in it, some, some gain, like an amplifier. You can use transistors, you can use inverters. Inverters are pretty good, that's probably what I'll use today. Um, you can use op amps, comparators, any of these things where a change in the input signal can cause a sudden change in the output signal. Um, basically what you need to do on top of that is somehow feed back that output signal into the input signal, preferably with a small delay, uh, and that then the, the, the duration of that delay then controls the frequency of the oscillation because that, that negative feedback uh, will mean that the device changes state again after that delay uh, and then starts outputting the opposite signal which causes it after another delay to change back to the first state again. You don't really expect to get a nice clean square wave out of that but there are things you can do after um, that circuit to, to sort of square up the results. Um, and yeah, so the basic circuit that I'm going to make today, I think, is to use inverters, and I'm going to use Schmidt inverters. Oh, damn it, I've written that the wrong way up. <laughs> well, whatever. Schmidt inverters. Um, the reason for this is because of what I'm going to be feeding into it. Um, but if you take the output of the inverter, when, when, the, when the input is low, the output is going to be high. What I want to do with that output is basically to start charging up a capacitor. So let's draw that down here. Um, I can go straight to ground with that, I think. Um, I think I'm probably going to need a resistor in there as well, just to just to just to control the rate that that capacitor charges at. So um, I don't know. Let's draw that resistor in here. Um, and we're just going to take feedback from the output here. So when, when this inverter's input is low, the output's going to be high. This capacitor will charge through this resistor. Um, the charge time is a multiple of the resistance times the capacitance. So that gives us quite a lot of control over, over, the, over that period. And when the voltage across the capacitor reaches a certain threshold voltage, if I kind of just feed that straight back in here, when that, when that reaches a certain threshold voltage, it should trigger the Schmidt trigger inverter to flip to the opposite state. And at that point, this input here will be low, and that will discharge the capacitor. I'm going to insert another resistor here. I'll make this quite a big one, because I don't want current to flow through this resistor, really. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I've got in my... I've got, I've got a whole giant pile of parts here, I'll, I'll see what I can pull out there. Something like a meg or maybe 100k or something like that will do for that. And um, what that means is that when the, when the output goes low, it will start to discharge this capacitor again through that same resistor, just discharge it back this way into the, into the output of the inverter. And when that gets below another threshold voltage, um, so when the input gets below another threshold voltage, it will flip state again, and the output will go high and it'll start charging again and blah blah blah. The importance of the Schmidt inverter here is that it is specced to deal consistently with inputs across the whole voltage range. So most TTL parts have a sort of, um, they usually call it the minimum input high voltage and the maximum input low voltage. So for, a, for an LSTTL, I think the minimum input high is about 2.5 to 2.7 volts or something like that. And 
anything above that is considered high. And then the maximum input low is pretty low, so it's like 0 0.7, I think, for LSTTL. And anything below that's considered low. The problem is you have that middle ground where it's not really considered high or low, and depending on the part, um, it may actually flip the state backwards and forwards. It might not actually consistently read high or low in that state. So the difference with a Schmidt inverter, or, the, or a Schmidt trigger input, is that within that intermediate state it just sticks to the value the, the part was already using. Um, and when the input voltage in, an, in a Schmidt inverter reaches a specific voltage level, Again, it slightly depends on the part, but when it reaches that level, it will turn on, and it's guaranteed that once it's turned on, it stays on until that input voltage drops below another much lower threshold. So that means that unless you're going backwards and forwards quite a bit in that intermediate region, you get a very clean on-off kind of behaviour, which is obviously what we want here, because of the way this capacitor is going to work. I've drawn a better diagram of it here. So it's basically... Schmidt inverter output goes back to the input via a couple of resistors and halfway along there's this capacitor in the way. So what kind of capacitors have I got lying about? Got something red. Not 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 tiny but not huge. A few microfarads would be great. There we go, 4.7 microfarads. Perfect. Just the job. So yeah, I'll I'll do it from this top rail here just to Make things a bit upside down. Um, here we go. So for this resistor, well for this resistor I want something relatively large. Let's see what I've got. I think of 10k at the least. Here's 100k I think, that'll do. So um, take that from one of the inputs over to here. Let's move that capacitor along a bit. So that it's on there now. Um, and then this resistor going to the output. Um, that one that one could be that, that that one's the one that charges and discharges through. So if that's 4.7 mic. Oh my god, I had a I had a 1k just now, didn't I? What do I do with that? I've lost the damn thing. Oh well. Um, what else have I got? Yeah, no, there, there, there's a 1k. Don't know if it's the same one. Doesn't really matter, they're all the same. I'll just put 1k down to the bottom row there for now. Um, and I can use this nice green wire to join the two together. Well, that's a bit horrific in terms of bridging over things. So that's the basic circuit. I put this extra inverter on the end here because because this terminal here is part of the inverter circuit. Um, again, I want to have a nice high impedance input here, so that there's no um, there's no chance of whatever's connected to this end affecting the the the, the behaviour of the inverter circuit. So um, I'm just going to use one more of the inverters to um, essentially to buffer that output signal. So I'll pop that in there, and that next inverter is now ready to buffer that. Let's also wire up some of these unused inputs just to just to be safe. So this will probably now oscillate. What I could probably do is I've got a meter here. I can stick that meter on Hertz mode. I'm going to probe from the ground to the signal. Um, I, I, I'm going to make, to make that a bit easier. I'm going to stick a little extra terminal in that signal. Here's a nice nice fat off cut from. Some unlucky resistor somewhere, it's probably quite a low resistance one. The, the low resistance resistors with the higher power ratings tend to have thicker wires, I find. So I'm going to stick that in the output from that second inverter there. Um, you probably can't see that very well on the camera. But it'll be easy for me to put the probe on. So let's hit the power. I've, I have wired everything up, haven't I? I think I have. Let's see what happens, turn that on. Just just checking on the power supply that there's no high current flowing there and this this power supply is a it's a pretty cheap power supply it only has two decimal digits of amps and two decimal digits of watts but that's now reading five volts with 0 0.00 on the amps and watts <clears throat> so that's exactly what I was hoping for 
means that there's no excessive current flowing, which probably means I haven't screwed up the wiring too much. Um, if I see a large current, I start to worry and maybe turn the power supply off because it could overheat things. So just grabbing that ground terminal of the inverter there and the uh, output of this inverter here, we're reading about, what's that, one point, that's a bit all over the place, 1.7, 1.6 megahertz. Well, that's a bit faster than I wanted. The trouble with that kind of frequency is you start running into issues with what you can achieve on a breadboard. Um, it's bouncing around all over the place as well. I don't think that's very stable as it is. What I'm going to do, can't be, can't be bothered to turn the power off. Pull that resistor out. Actually, that was that really wasn't holding in very well. I'm going to replace it with a 5k, um, 5.1k. Here we go. Pop that one in. Where was it? Over there. This is just a 5.1k resistor. We'll see what difference that makes. In theory, it should be about a fifth of the frequency. So I suppose we're shooting for about 200 to 300 kilohertz here. Let's see what shows up. That's more like the ballpark that I want, really. What have we got? Ooh, 67 hertz, that's a bit low. That's more like the, the mains hum than anything. Hmm, maybe I haven't got a good contact here. Oh, I'm still getting 1.8 megahertz though, what have I done wrong? This is just completely a bad circuit. Have I just made a mess of that? Hmm. You can also see what the duty cycle of that is. It's not going to be very instructive though. No, is that a 75%? That's not bad actually. It could be worse. What's going on with this frequency then? Changing that resistor should have reduced that a lot. I'm going to whack that on the oscilloscope and see what it looks like. So, my scope code. My workbench is an absolute mess. But I can usually find what I want eventually. I've got the probe on 10 times. Um, let's drop that down to 1 times at first because I don't know if it's properly calibrated. Um, I'm going to measure the output frequency first of all there. Turn the scope on. What I'm seeing is about 3.5 squares between rising peaks on this at the moment. So what you can see on that scope trace is a rather short period of low and a rather long period of high. If I had to guess it's about 5 milliseconds low, uh, 12 milliseconds high at the moment. The reason for that is that this inverter, it's a, like I said, it's a Schmidt inverter, which means it has a relatively, or it has a, it has a distinct difference between the threshold at which it turns, it, it treats the input as on, and the threshold at which it treats the input as off. So the capacitor here will be sending the input up and down in a smooth fashion. I'll grab that on the scope as well. That really illustrates what's going on. It looks like the low point on this trace is around. 0.7-ish volts, and the high point's about 1.5. The reason that those are relatively low compared to the 5 volt supply is that this is actually an HCT chip. It's because under TTL logic it has to consider anything above about 2 volts to be on. So this is actually turning on when that input signal reaches about 1.5 volts, and it's turning off again when, that, when the signal descends to about 0.7.8 volts. Um, and 
this actually leads to this waveform where the the climb is much quicker than the descent. The reason for that is that capacitors charge a lot quicker, a lot more quickly when the target voltage is further from the capacitor's current charge voltage. And the charge voltage, the, the, the amount we're, we're targeting when we're charging up that capacitor is 5 volts. So we're going from about 0.7 volts up to 1.5 volts rather quickly because we're, we're a long way away from the 5 volts. When that flips around and starts outputting 0 volts and we start discharging the capacitor, we're actually really close to 0 volts already, so it's a bit slower the discharge. What we need to do to fix that, I think, is to reduce that 5 volt charging voltage to be a bit more symmetrical around the trigger points of this waveform. So if we say that the trigger here is about 1, 1 and a quarter volts, one and a quarter, I'm saying 1 and a quarter because that's a quarter of 5, if I actually just do a simple 1 to 1 voltage divider from that output pin to ground, I'll, I'll, I'll be using a 2 and a half volt charge voltage rather than a 5 volt charge voltage and it should make that uh, that, that, that leading edge slope be about the same as the trailing edge slope. So I'll see if I can find another 1k resistor, that should be enough to do that. Oh hang on, no, that was a 5k wasn't it? I'll see if I can find another 5k then. I need to make a voltage divider from here to here. Okay, that's, that's completely the wrong thing to do. What I'll do is I will take the 5k5 resistor, the 5k1 resistor from that output over to this row here. Let's get the scope off the capacitor a minute. <clears throat> then I will make my voltage divider to ground. So now we have a nice five, uh, a nice one-to-one -one divider here. The capacitor is going to I'll squeeze it in underneath the resistor there. So the capacitor is going to come from the halfway point on that divider. Um, and for it to oscillate again we need this uh, 100k resistor feedback onto the input. So I will pop that back in here. And see what happens. So that's looking a lot better. And let's also show what the square wave looks like. It should be, it should be really even now. I have to turn that volts per division down a bit. There we go. That's looking much better in terms of evenness of signal. I think that's pretty much 50-50. Let's have a look what the meter says. We're getting about 80 hertz there. And if I Look at the duty cycle. Like I said, looking at the scope, I reckon that's about 50%. Ooh, bang on, 50.2%. And that's it. We've successfully built a basic oscillator. My next plan is to extend this to be a voltage-controlled oscillator, which I'll do in a second video. That means that a input voltage will define the frequency of the oscillation, rather than us having to change the capacitance or resistance of these components. As always, please like, subscribe, press the notification bell if you want to be notified when I post the follow-up video on the voltage-controlled oscillator. And please comment down below if you have any thoughts on the format of the video, length, level of detail, anything like that. Let me know and maybe I can adapt what I do in future videos based on your feedback.